What's up friends? Welcome back to another World Science video. Today we're going to test the endurance capacity of Sophia. Sophia is an uh, elite CrossFit athlete and we know they're all very strong. But do they also have the conditioning? That's the question of today. Uh, Sophia, you ready? Yeah. Ready for this? All right. Very that's, ready. That's, that's good. <laughs> She's already motivated. Let's see in a, in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, what we're going to do with this, with this test is we're going to... Um, do a step test to exhaustion. I will explain you in a minute how that works. And we are going to measure lactate as well as uh, muscle oxygenation with a nurse device. Uh, I will explain you how to use that physiology in your own training, in your own testing uh, to optimize your training and to be become a more efficient athlete. So without further ado, uh, let's, let's go straight into it. Let's go. Alright, so how will we do this test? Uh, here you see uh, the, the time on the x-axis, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 and so on minutes. And then we also have the intensity in watts, uh, 60, 90, 120. So Sophia will start at 60 watts, which is a very easy pace and she will uh, cycle for, for 3 minutes. And then uh, the next block will be uh, 6 minutes at, at 90 watts, 120 watts and so forth until she reaches, reaches exhaustion. We will measure oxygenation uh, with nurse as well as lactate to determine her thresholds and how well uh, she is actually trained in her, let's say, endurance spectrum or the conditioning spectrum. So really looking forward to, to see what uh, Sophia can do here. <laughs> All right, Sophia, how did it go? Good, it was Good. hard, yeah. It but was hard. Lost, it. lost couple rounds. It was very hard. Enjoyed it, that's, that's what a crossfit always <laughs> says, enjoyed it. Like no one enjoys it except for crossfitters. <laughs> Amazing. So what do we have here? I plotted the data. This is the, the watts, so you see all the numbers here, the watts on the x-axis and on the y-axis I have the lactate in millimolars per liter. And you see in the first two rounds, so at 60 and 90, she even goes down in lactate because the lactate is actually used by non-working muscles, the lactate produced. So if you start uh, working out, it goes down slightly when the intensity is still very low. But then it goes into this middle zone, this yellow zone mostly, uh, zone 3, zone 4, where you uh, have an in, in increased in, uh, lactate production, uh, but it doesn't go exponentially up yet. And this only starts from, uh, let's say, 180, 210 watts. It goes up clean very exponentially because the lactate you produce is outpaced uh, or, or it's, it outpaces the, the, the lactate that you actually are burning or, or uh, using as an energy source. So you see here, 20.5 millimolar per liter for some people who know a little bit about exercise physiology, that's extremely high. We only see this in cross meters and like um, 400 meter runners or something that go really in this, this anaerobic uh, zone. So beautiful curve. What can we take out of this? That's the question now, okay? And the question is, um, you can use this to assess your threshold. So your threshold power, you hear, you hear about this a lot, all the time, threshold power, but using this, Simple test, 
you can actually uh, uh, assess this quite easy. And we want to know the most exponential phase of your curve. And we can do this with several methods. I used uh, the D-max method. And this would allow us to see that it's around 190, 180 watts your most exponential curve in this like data production, you see? And uh, this would be your pace, your threshold pace that you can, let's say, write the, the red line or write the line. Um, this is a typical, uh, something you can then sustain for 20 to 30 minutes, depends a little bit on the athlete. And uh, what we mean with threshold is that the lactate doesn't go up more or doesn't go down at a certain threshold. So if you would ride or bike at 190 watts, your lactate would be high, 6, 7, right? But it would not incrementally go up anymore. You're just, just at that threshold. If you would go at 220 watts, a little bit higher, then the lactate would uh, actually that's one way to measure your uh, thresholds. Maybe you can, uh, we can also have a look at the nurse data because we want to actually compare using a non-invasive nurse measurement uh, with the, the more invasive lactate uh, threshold. So what I have here is your uh, right time, beautiful. Okay, so this is typically what we always see. In the beginning, it stays nicely, uh, let's say even and balanced, it, it stays the same. That's because your oxygen delivery is uh, the same as your oxygen, let's say, uh, consumption. So we me uh, measure with NIRS the amount of uh, hemoglobin that is actually oxygenated within the tissue. And um, yeah, obviously when you start working out, you consume oxygen, but you also deliver more oxygen because of the heart starts pumping. And that's why we see when it matches perfectly, you see this nice green line that stays flat. A little bit the same as the lactate, I would say. Then you get in these middle zones where it decreases slowly, not exponentially, uh, because there's a match or there's a slight mismatch between oxygen consumption and oxygen uh, delivery. Goes down, goes down, goes down, starts to go down a bit more. And then in this yellow zone where it goes kind of exponentially down, that would also be your threshold power, or very close to your threshold power. And this, if we look at the data here, it's around 17 to 18 minutes. This corresponds to the end of 210 watts to uh, approximately, approximately, let's say, the same as uh, based on your lactate curve. Good. So um, yeah, that's 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 quite nice. So using NIRS in your time, we can also measure and assess your uh, threshold. Would be quite closely related to what we assess traditionally. I would say in um, exercise physiology with lactate. But then I also assessed your bicep. It's still there. Uh, why? Because I thought if you're biking, you're not really using your biceps too much or your arms too much most people <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe what, what happens right like what, what would happen if all the oxygen is extra or, or used by by the lower body and what would you or what would happen with nerves or with muscle oxygenation in the, the arm and this kind of surprised me because you see here beautifully the same in the beginning it stays kind of flat yeah and then uh, it goes down as well but then it goes exponentially down really at the end so look at this this is around uh yeah like, like 20 to 21 minutes so at the end let's say 240 when you were suffering I would yeah. say quite a lot then it goes completely exponentially down to a very low uh, percentage like, it was like 24 23, or so, yeah. 23 which is much lower than actually the your thigh. oxygenation of the tie which was surprising to me so why is this the case so why is this the case that's always a question uh i don't know for sure obviously because we're still learning but one of the things i think is because in the beginning it stays obviously quite the same because you don't really pull on your handles too yeah. much you're just biking yeah. quite nicely like you're biking in zurich and yeah. <laughs> But then at the end, um, the oxygen delivery was already very restricted because all, yeah, mostly your lower body is consuming all the oxygen. Yeah. And then when you start pulling a little bit more, you can see it also in the B-rolls, you start pulling a little bit more because you're, you're, you're really suffering and trying to get all the energy out, uh, then it goes down. down yeah. uh, because yeah, there is already very limited oxygen supply and then when you start using it a little bit more, then it goes exponentially down. So that's uh, that's something we see. Interestingly, if you if you put both graphs on top of each yeah. other, um, you see that um, the reoxygenation is very quick in the the time. So that's what we always see. Once you stop exercising, bam, the blood flows back. But then, if you have um, 
the bicep, it took like four minutes yeah, or so. Yeah, it took a long time. It took a long time. And you told me... I'm quite limited in... Uh, well, my upper body blows up fast, especially my forearms, my biceps too, though. A lot of so grip, pulling, pulling yeah. yeah. That's and not I, your I strength? A lot. No, it's not my strength. And once it blows up, I can't get the lactate out again. It just stays Interesting. there. Yeah, it seems to be corresponding to this data yeah. that for some reason, potentially your, 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 your blood is kind of restricted towards your biceps. And that's why, obviously, when you start working out, it just desaturates super uh, a lot. So that's why uh, even conditioning in your biceps, for example, using uh, an echo bike where you only yeah. would do uh, um, arms or a top thing. So you think that working you. like aerobically yes. in yes. my upper yes. body? Yeah. Because I think you have a you have a, maybe a restricted diffusion of oxygen yeah. in your bicep. You have quite like muscular <laughs> biceps, you know. So the oxygen can potentially not really diffuse yeah. that well, and you blow up quickly. Yeah, because I cycle. A lot every day. Yes, you see it. To you the see box, it. Your so, stroke is nice. So yeah. my legs don't blow up much, but I do yeah. find my yeah. upper yeah. body. Blows and it's up important for CrossFit. Yeah, 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 definitely. So once the grip's gone, like if I can maintain a pace where the grip doesn't go, it's fine. But if I blow up, yeah, it's done, and yeah. you don't come back. And that's clear because you actually yeah. don't come back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Five minutes of rest. Exactly, so. exactly. All right, so that's uh, that's how you can use this data. You can use such an uh, easy test. You can also do it in your own uh, gym, strapping a nurse device on and just uh, see where your threshold is. Um, these, these apps also have more and more user-friendly designs where you can actually uh, assess your, or it provides you your threshold yeah. based on the data. So that's quite cool. You don't have to look at it yourself. Like what you would expect from a CrossFit athlete. Yes. Yes, I want to say it's this. Interesting, uh, yeah. That's interesting. So um, obviously, so I would expect this from a cross yeah. Exactly what you have: a very short base, two, three rounds, and then goes up already and mm -hmm. exponentially up. So that's what we always see in cross because they don't train almost zone two. Yeah. Right? Zone two training is not really there. If you would do a lot of zone two training, this would actually be extended a lot. So typical, um, let's say, endurance cyclist runners, they have a much longer base. And they don't go up that much because their aerobic system, the complete aerobic system, is much more, uh, yeah, better, better, better trained than yours. Is this bad? No, this is just how you train, yeah. basically. It's very difficult to say it's bad or, or not. But I think you could improve um, your base a little bit better. Certainly, when you are doing longer workouts, the higher pace you can keep on on a, on a bike or on a, on a on an erg will definitely be important because in yeah. CrossFit now ergs are actually very important. big, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's usually how it goes. So how would this compare to your average CrossFitter? For yes, so average CrossFitter uh, will not get uh, females won't get uh, two seventy. So so Sophia finished two seventy watts. That's what it's uh, exactly twenty four minutes. That's a very good test. But you did this by pushing, yeah. by really getting into the high uh, threshold basis. Um, so that's that's how elite athletes, like like semi-finalists usually perform. I tested a couple of semi-finalists, games athletes. Usually 270 for the for the females are getting there. Males, 360. Yeah. Finishing around 360 is a very good test. 340, 360. Uh, that's, that's, that's how it is. Um, so for a typical CrossFit athlete, like average uh, Joe and Jane, 200, 210, that's usually how it is. Uh, and if you want to improve it, zone two, for sure. And also, uh, yeah, just doing more erg intervals. Yeah. Let's let's have a look at the heart rate as well. Um, it's always interesting, but it's not that interesting yeah. in my opinion as a, as a nurse device. So heart rate is usually linearly correlated or linearly related to your intensity. All right. So the higher the intensity, the higher the heart rate until you reach the top and then you just yeah. go down. Sometimes you don't really see it with you, you see even a flattening out of the maximum heart rate. So yeah. even when the intensity increases, you don't get towards the higher heart rate. For you, you don't really see this. <laughs> so, but you can use this data yeah. now. You can put this over this data, yeah. obviously. That's very useful because now you can know 180 will be, whatever I have to, have to see, will be, let's say, 160. Like 15 minutes? Yeah, at 15, tell me. 175 to yeah. 180. Yeah. So 175 would be your heart rate that you that around your threshold. I yeah. think this might correspond to what you. What yeah, you're it's feeling. like the top end zone four. Yes, the, yeah. the top end zone four yeah. exactly is your threshold. So heart rate is actually only useful if you have such data. Yeah. Unless you're planning on just training zone two because then you can. But even on zone two, some people, some CrossFit athletes, maybe the last part, um, they think they're going in zone two. 
and they're actually in zone three or they're actually deoxygenating their muscle because they're so muscular, yeah. a little bit like your bicep. They're so muscular, every activity they do, they have a desaturation. And then you're not in your zone two. Yeah. You're only in the zone two where there's a complete match. And that's why nearest it can be very useful. That's really interesting. Yeah. That's really interesting. So um, for me, for example, I have to go very slow in zone two. I sometimes have to stop because I start to desaturate. Oh no, I cannot can desaturate and I go home. When I run. Well, yeah, that's an interesting one because obviously, we, yes, we run in CrossFit, but we don't run that much. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not a strong runner. I'm much stronger on a rowing machine or a bike yeah. than I am running. And yeah. um, it'll be interesting to see, like, Zone two running. Yeah. Obviously, you think you're in zone two, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't know. Probably you don't know. <laughs> you know, indeed. All right, that was it for this video. Hope you liked it. Super easy, uh, tough test, obviously, but easy to do. Uh, thanks, Sophia, for uh, for doing this. Very valuable data. Hope you found it interesting as well. You can find the the links to all the devices I used in the description. Go go have a look. Also, we have some free training plans to actually improve your conditioning using Zone Two and uh, interval training. So that's actually a seven-week training plan you just improve for sure uh, using using those data. Good. That was it for today. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the next video. And that was cool. Awesome. Ciao. Bye bye.